If the kid in your life likes horses, they'll love this book. Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff is a fun and informative book for kids age 7 to 10. Stay tuned as we explore the book. I'm Dan Skinner and welcome to The Kids Bookshelf. I requested and was provided with a copy of the book, but otherwise this video is not sponsored. Christina Sauer is an associate editor for National Geographic Kids. She joins us to talk about Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff, fun facts, awesome info, cool games, silly jokes, and more. Christina, welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Dan. How are you doing today? I'm doing well and looking forward to talking with you about Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff. Now, before we talk about some of the specific information in the book, give us an overview. What are kids going to find here? Oh, this is a great book for ages 7 to 10. It's chock full of everything from trivia to jokes to little bits of personality quizzes to aspirational individuals like experts from a horse therapist to a filmmaker to a horse trainer. It's really just a great introductory book for kids who do love the horses, but maybe are just early into reading. This is a National Geographic Kids publication, so tell us more about the audience you envision for the book. I'd say 7 to 10. It, it could skew a little bit younger if you have that adorable sibling pairing or best friends who've got a little bit more of a vocabulary, but most of it would be 7 to 10, that early elementary grade. You know, there's so many different breeds of horses in the world. Describe the variety of horses you cover in the book. Yes. So I don't know about you, but I feel like I had such a great experience as a kid with horses and I was obsessed with them too, which we kind of inspired this book's theme. Um, and for me, I grew up actually with horses. So I had a little bit of a background going into this book of what I like and what I don't like, but I learned so much from this. Everything from did you know a Belgian draft horse is about the same weight as a baby humpback whale? The massiveness of that just astounded me. And then we also talk about things like, okay, so what are those horses that you see in almost every single movie? You know, the one where the mane's flowing behind it. And we talk about that's a Frisian and why they're usually used in, in movies is because they just have that stellar looking shiny coat. They're massive. All the princesses wear, <laughs> ride them in the movies. We also talk about animals like the Arabians and the fact that how are they, when you see photos of them, always having their tails stand up? And we say, well, actually, that's because in their spine, they have two less vertebrae, which allows them to stick up their tail. Who would have thought? So we really just delve into every kind of horse that a kid loves, even the miniature horses, which personally are one of my favorites. They're under 38 inches, tiny, but kind of a little fierce and feisty. Christina, as you mentioned, you grew up with horses, so you have a natural fascination with horses. But why do you think so many people have such an affinity with horses? You know, horses are such expressive and communicative creatures. I feel like a lot of us relate to them. And we've seen examples of this, especially with therapy, whether it's hippotherapy, where someone who might not have as great a balance or core strength gets on a horse and it almost there's this connection that we can't really under or explain, but it does simulate walking there. The horse kind of knows when and to stop or understand if you start to fall. We've seen rescue horses. But we also see that horses have 17 different expressions, which is almost the same amount of expressions as humans. So there is a lot of communication. Maybe we can't talk to them directly, but when we look into their eyes, there's something that, that just is different than other animals. And it makes sense. We've been, they've been domesticated for about 4,000 years. So we've had this pairing of man and horse for many, many years thousands of years. Now, you cover this in the book, so let's talk a bit more about communication. What do we know about how horses communicate with humans and the body language they use to let us know how they're feeling? Yeah, so this is kind of the fun aspect of this book, is I feel like any aspiring veterinarian, horse trainer, or, or animal enthusiast will love all the details we go into. So in this particular one, when it comes to communication, we talk about when you see a horse, how do you know how it's feeling? If the ears are pinned back, if we see the nostrils kind of flaring and it starts to paw the ground, that usually means something's upsetting it. And it may be your presence, so be careful when you approach the horse. 
Then we talk about when it's calm. It's really sweet. You see their little eyes start to get droopy. They might drool a little bit. Their ears go out to the side. And their ears are so important to them. So you can kind of get where they're feeling. So if it's out to the side, it means they're kind of just being hmm, not too concerned about the world. I'm just kind of lazy. If they're pointed straight at you or back, that means that it's trying to figure out where their threat is. So you can just, based on their facial expressions and, and physical features on their heads, know, oh, I should come towards or I should stay away. The book also describes how horses interact with each other. For example, tell us about what happens when a new horse is introduced into a herd. Yeah, so when horses talk to each other, they call it nickering, and it's that cute little sound that they make. But the truth is, when especially males come into a herd, which is a group of horses, they have to kind of establish who is that alpha. And while a herd is actually led by a female, that dominant horse or that alpha horse is a male. So when a new one comes in, they usually, you'll see a little bit of brawling. You'll see them getting up on their hind legs and pawing at each other, a little bit of biting. And that actually is completely normal. And sometimes it's a little scary as humans to see that because we don't like any kind of conflict. But that basically establishes where I am in that hierarchy or order of horses. I'm talking with Christina Sauer about Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff from National Geographic Kids. And so far, we've been talking about domesticated horses, but there are also places where wild horses still continue to roam. There are. So we actually do a little bit of a feature on an amazing filmmaker who's kind of made it her mission to protect the wild horses, specifically in the United States. And I didn't know this either. It was There's about 86,000 horses wandering the U.S. that are wild. And the U.S. tries to, to rein them in and, and capture them to prevent overpopulation. But the truth is a lot of those horses are not, aren't adopted. And then we have to do measures that really are very sad to get rid of them because there's too many of them. So we kind of talk about what are the issues and also what kids can do too. Maybe they are looking to get a horse or they know someone who has a center that could adopt one of them, um, just kind of empowering kids to understand what the issues are and what, what actions are being taken to protect horses. Well, as you well know, if you're going to have a horse, you have to feed them and they eat a lot. You know, there's that old expression, eating like a horse. Well, why do horses eat so much? Oh my goodness. If you think about how big that horse is, you know that they need a lot of food. And they mostly, they don't eat the same kind of foods that humans do. So we get a lot of our energy from protein. Animals don't. They get it from, the horses get our herbivores, so they get it from grasses and grains, which honestly go through your body pretty quickly. So those horses who are actually only asleep one to three hours a day spend most of the rest of that time eating in order to make sure they have enough nutrients and that they're eating enough to kind to be able to run those fast speeds or get from one place to the next on horseback. Well, like most National Geographic books, Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff is filled with wonderful photographs. It also has lots of little sections that entertain but also educate kids about horses, including horse quizzes, horse scrambles, horse humor, <laughs> and pony puns. Yes. Uh, can you tell us more about these? Absolutely. So part of this book is a little bit aspirational. This is the age, 7 to 10, when kids start to wonder, what do I want to be when I grow up? And they want to go beyond, you know, firefighter, doctor, things that they see around them. And some of the times, you know, we talk about, well, what do you like? And a kid many times will go, well, I like horses. Well, what does that mean? So we actually have, one, we have personality quizzes, which kind of give them a nice sense of what horse would I like, what horses are similar to me. Also, finding out what horse what is my own personality based on what the traits of a horse is? I'm personally a Tennessee walker, and that's what I found out. I am no Mustang. I should just be chill and relaxed. But it's fun to find those things out. The other part is you could do that personality quiz. We'll ask, like, in this situation, what do you like, this or this? And at the end, you find out, oh, maybe I would be a good horse trainer or a veterinarian or maybe even just somebody who does horse therapy. So it really empowers kids to think, oh, there's something more than maybe I don't want to be a veterinarian and, and deal with medical or, or blood and guts and things like that. But I, I do still want to be there with the horses and take care of them. 
Can you tell us a pony pun? Oh my goodness. I, one of my favorite was, <laughs> what are the two most famous horse thieves? Bonnie and Clydesdale. <laughs> <laughs> we have so many great dad jokes in here. I'm sure parents and kids are going to love going back and forth reading all of them. And you have lots of horse trivia, too. Now, one of my favorites is about a horse named J.J. Summer Breeze. It had the longest tail hair ever recorded. It was 12 feet, 6 inches, which is amazing. Could you, I mean, could you imagine even just, I'm thinking of my own hair. I'm thinking that would be so long to take care of. They had to have braided that all the time because otherwise it would have been in tangles and knots. <laughs> In addition to the trivia, there's a lot of general information about horses. As you were editing the book, I'm sure that even though you were very familiar with horses, you learned some new things as well. What was one of the most surprising things you learned about horses that you didn't know before? Yeah, so we actually, with all National Geographic kids' books, we have expert reviewers on it. So we had this wonderful woman out of the University of Georgia. Her name was uh, Kari Turner, and she kind of brought us some facts that we didn't even know and kind of clarified some subjects. And for me, one of the ones that I found the funniest was, did you know that a horse's hoof is not a foot at all? It's just a toenail. So it can be trimmed. You can, with safe paint, you can paint a horse's toenails or their hooves. That's interesting. I never thought that you could have a very fashion-conscious horse with painted toenails. Exactly. Another section in Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff is about horses that don't exist. Can you tell us about the mythical horses you cover in the book? Yes. Yeah, so I feel like in this section, all of the kids who absolutely love fantasy, whether it's Harry Potter or another of their favorite books, this or Percy Jackson, this one's for them. So we even talk about things like a hippogriff. And what is, what is that? So it's not, it is completely fabricated, but it has attributes of the horse, which is the head of a griffin and the body of a horse. Um, we talk about the fact that there was a creature that led Poseidon's chariot in Greek mythology, and they imagined it as a tail, like a mermaid with the body of a horse. So again, we always relate horses and animals, even in ancient, ancient history, and we create our own versions, too. Wouldn't it be cool? Who wouldn't want a unicorn in their lives? <laughs> For the young people in your life who love horses, the book is Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff. Fun facts, awesome info, cool games, silly jokes, and more. Christina Sauer is an associate editor for National Geographic Books. Christina, thank you for talking with me today. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to share this amazing book. <laughs> If you'd like to get a copy of Can't Get Enough Horse Stuff, I've placed a link for you in the description below. Well, thank you for watching this edition of the Kids Bookshelf. And if you'd like to see more videos about children's books and their authors, be sure to like, subscribe, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Until next time, keep sharing the gift of reading.